before diving into today's conversation, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covariant, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and dataset versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covariant are big users of Weights and Biases. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. Robot Brains Podcast. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Dr. Peter Beal with Robot Brains Podcast. How do you hear me? Hey, Peter, I have you loud and clear. How do you, how me? Wonderful. I can hear you so well. Woody, <laughs> today's episode is pretty crazy for me. Um, I'm connected with NASA astronaut Dr. Woody Hoberg, who's at the International Space Station at this very moment. Woody, I can't believe this is happening. Talking with you as you're up at the International Space Station. So excited to have you on the show. Peter, thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk with you today. And I have to say, your podcast is, has definitely one of the coolest names of any podcast out there. Thank you, Woody. Now, Woody, you grew up north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You did your undergraduate at MIT. From there came to Berkeley, where I had the great honor to be your PhD advisor. Then you spent some time at Boeing and became professor at MIT. Quite the career already. But then, as professor at MIT, you got the opportunity to go into NASA's astronaut training, and here you are, achieving your lifelong dream. What did it feel like as pilot of SpaceX Crew-6 to pilot a rocket into space and get to the ISS? Well, Peter, it, it felt amazing. I can still remember, uh, well, first of all, the ride was absolutely incredible. We get up to uh, around four Gs on both the first and second stage. So it's just an absolute uh, sports car of a rocket, truly a thrill. And then at second engine cutoff, we're suddenly weightless. And for me, that was back in early March. So it's just wild. I went from, you know, never having had this life experience to here we are uh, many months into my mission now. And I've just been living and working in weightlessness the whole time. One of the amazing things to me is just how quickly the body, the human body adapts to new environments. I feel like I've lived and breathed that every day up here. So you think it's going to be a big surprise when you get back on Earth <laughs> several you know, months down the line and <laughs> just have to deal with gravity again? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely that's actually one of the uh, things we spend a lot of time on up here is just exercise. We know that the uh, human body uh, is challenged living in weightlessness and then returning to a 1G environment. So things like bone density and muscle mass are things that we really have to work hard to maintain up here um, just because we're completely unloaded at all times. Actually, interestingly, my spine also grew uh, several inches just from uh, not being under load up here. So lots of changes, and we work hard every day to... Uh, do those countermeasures that are really crucial to our rehabilitation when we get back to Earth. Wow, I didn't realize you, you, would, you would grow. I mean, this seems like uh, basketball players might want to uh, join you in space sometime. <laughs> now, Woody, we also have you on video. So is there any chance you can show something off to, to showcase you are truly in a essentially zero gravity, technically microgravity environment? Yeah, we're actually, uh, we're in free fall all the time. So we are in low Earth orbit here. We're about 250 miles above Earth. There's tons of gravity up here, and that's what's keeping us in orbit. But because that gravity is acting on me with exactly the same force that it's acting on the space station, and there's no other external forces, 
I'm completely weightless here. And so uh, everything floats, the microphone floats, and there's really no up or down. We kind of designate uh, the way that I've been appearing on camera this whole time. We kind of designate this as right side up. Uh, toward my head right now is away from Earth. Down toward the floor is towards Earth. Um, but really, all of the different orientations I could be in feel exactly the same to me. It's one of the remarkable things up here. Now, Woody, flying rockets, being in space are obviously mind-boggling achievements and experiences. Um, being at the ISS, what you're doing there, how would you say it's impacting humanity today and in the future? I love that question, Peter. I think humanity has an innate uh, desire for, to explore. And I think that this is one big part of uh, uh, our constant exploration as humanity. I see the ISS's contribution as two main things. Number one, it's the science return. So we've had a continuous present, human presence up here for over uh, 22 years now and counting. And uh, over that time period, we've done literally thousands of research experiments. And this it tends to focus on things that can only be accomplished here in this weightless environment, things like novel protein folding or manufacturing structures that can't hold up under their own weight but are nevertheless interesting structures, or studying uh, the human body and our adaptation to this unique environment. And so this uh, scientific research is relevant both to applications back on Earth, and then it's also relevant as we look to explore with human space exploration uh, deeper into the solar system. And then number two, I see this place as a proving ground. So our experience living and working in space up here over that long time period has really taught us. And as you know well, uh, it's one thing to implement new algorithms, but sometimes you really have to put it on the real robot, on the real hardware, you know, roll out your policy and see how it actually performs. And so we need this real proving ground where we can test out our tools and techniques and uh, use them as we move forward ultimately to the moon and Mars. And those are our next goals in the next decade. Well, I love both of the, the main things you highlight there, the, the scientific advances that are, are possible thanks to experiments there and humanity moving forward beyond Earth at some point, which speaks to many people's imagination, obviously, and might even be necessary in case something happens on Earth that we can't um, uh, defend ourselves against in some way or other. Going to the science first, um, are you able to say something about specific scientific experiments you've done and their potential impact? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I've had the great pleasure to work on probably tens to hundreds of different uh, scientific research projects while I'm up here. So it's been really amazing. Um, a number of them are actually on work doing research on myself. So I am, in fact, the test subject. So one example there is I'm actually eating a modified diet up here. Um, I'm eating a lot of fish, some extra lycopene, and we're actually studying how that modified diet um, affects my immune system and um, some other measurements relevant to my adaptation to uh, long duration space flight. Another uh, example that's where I'm not the research subject um, was something called engineered heart tissues and another similar study called cardinal heart. And in both of those, we're looking at um, tissue chips and uh, heart muscle cells. And it turns out that heart muscle cells actually um, degrade more quickly up here in a weightless environment than they do on Earth. And so we're actually using this environment as a testing, uh, as a test ground to study treatments for things like heart disease. And so that's, uh, I, I really enjoyed working on that one just because uh, it does seem to have such you know, relevant payoff back on Earth. That's amazing. Um I'm curious when you mentioned the um, uh, immune system, Woody, um, I imagine when you're up in, in space, you're not exposed to a whole lot. Um, do you explicitly expose yourself to things then to, to test it? No, we try pretty hard to keep the, uh, the, any pathogens off the space station. We actually have a quarantine period before launch uh, just to make sure that we're as healthy as possible before we arrive. And then we also do a fair amount of testing. So we test our water um, we, we do some just swabbing around the uh, space station looking for uh, things like fungi and other microbes. 
Um, so we're constantly testing and making sure that we um, don't have anything like that up here. Oh, well, that, that's kind of a relief, actually, because <laughs> I don't think it'd be easy to uh, deal with anything up there. Um, one of the things that, that you mentioned, the other thing you mentioned on the science side is new materials, um, new biological experiments like protein structures. Um, can you say a little bit about that? What, what, what's the dream there? What, what could happen if some of these experiments are successful? Yeah, I think it's really cool. I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious that you might be able to uh, do interesting things in a weightless environment that you can't do in 1G. So things like 3D printing, where you want to manufacture really fine-grained structures that during the printing process can't actually support their own weight. We know, as another example, that proteins, uh, some proteins fold differently in a weightless environment than in 1G. So you can imagine all sorts of really interesting commercial applications of, um, of manufacturing, really, or, or doing you know, chemical synthesis, all sorts of um, interesting applications that are only possible in weightlessness. And an environment like this one is really the place where you could uh, carry out th that type of work. And so we're seeing right now kind of a thriving economy building in low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is the lowest orbit you can be in and just ach achieve long duration weightlessness. And I think the International Space Station has really spurred this rapidly growing uh, economy in low Earth orbit. And I think over the next decade, we're going to see some really, really interesting applications emerge here. So could I imagine that we effectively have factories flying around in low Earth orbit building things that would be really hard or impossible to build on Earth and somehow some rockets ship things back and forth? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, I, you know, it's, it's to be seen. I think the market will determine whether such an opportunity exists and, and is relevant. Um, but I think you could certainly imagine that occurring. And I, I'm just going to be fascinated to see uh, what comes out of really this new access we have to low Earth orbit. I mean, it's amazing. SpaceX this year is uh, probably going to launch on the order of 100 launches, so and most of them to low Earth orbit. So that's a launch every three or four days. It is just remarkable, um, our new capability that we have here to uh, put stuff up into low Earth orbit. That is absolutely amazing. Of course, the ones that are manned launches with a crew on board are much more rare, um, like the one you did. Um, I remember watching the scrubbed launch, and I, I watched you sitting there with the crew, and I saw nothing but calm. I'm like, this is the biggest moment in your life, I got to imagine, and the launch gets scrubbed. Is it a minute before takeoff was meant, meant to happen? And you're just sitting there so calm. But what was going on in your head? Are you really so calm at that moment? What's going on? Yeah, it's funny, Peter. In the months leading up during my training, leading up to launch, I always envisioned that I would be really nervous in the final moments before launch. And I was just amazed that on launch day, it was just so much like training. And I felt so prepared that I, I really was completely calm, just in the zone, um, locked into everything we're monitoring and and I was feeling very calm. The scrub, yeah, we, we scrubbed about two minutes and 20 seconds prior to launch due to um, an issue with some igniter fluid on the rocket. And I still remember that moment where we, we heard the um, LD come over the countdown net and say, uh, hold, hold, hold. So we knew we were not going to space that day. And I just remember thinking to myself, okay, we trained for what to do in the case of a scrub. We have a lot of propellant on board right now. Let's take a moment, take a deep breath, and then execute execute our procedures uh, correctly to get all the fuel off the rocket and safely uh, get ourselves off. So it was uh, actually a great trial run for uh, getting that close to launch. And then on the real launch day, when I actually launched, I was even that much more prepared for just knowing how I would feel and what all the sensations would be. Now, you mentioned that's one of the second big things for spending time at ISS uh, as humanity, not just this just you, um, is to potentially be able to explore space more easily by having been up there. Um, how about you personally? What do you think about, let's say, going to the moon, going to Mars? Are those things you dream of and, and would like to be part of? Or is this something that you just want to help, but maybe it's not for you? 
Oh, I dream of the moon every day, Peter. I'm so excited because we're uh, and we're actually going there with our uh, Artemis program. The Artemis 2 crew was just named. They're going to go on a mission and fly around the moon. And then with Artemis 3, we're going to land on the moon for the first time since Apollo. And I am thrilled about it. Um, I remember in college as a young engineer, kind of lamenting the fact that I was not alive during Apollo. And I felt like I kind of missed out on such an exciting time. And I, I really never would have dreamed that I would be kind of right in the thick of it, be a, a part of um, our new effort to go back to the moon. And I actually see a great analogy. We're kind of in a transition period right now. So I see an analogy to the ISS. The ISS has been such an incredible proving ground for technologies and operating in space. And that's exactly what we're going to go set up on the moon now. We're going to set up a proving ground and we're going to test out and mature all of the technologies and techniques that we need ultimately to put humans on Mars. Wow. Wow. Now, talking about college and, and really your, your upbringing and so forth, I remember when you got to Berkeley, Woody, you pulled me aside and you said, hey, I'm not going to be your, your typical PhD student. Yes, I'm going to try to do amazing research. That's what I'm here for. But I'll do some other things that might surprise you, but it's all part of a big plan, a big dream of maybe hopefully becoming an astronaut someday, knowing that's unlikely to happen, but you want to try everything you can to, to get that chance. Um, when did you know that that was going to be the thing you're pursuing? And from there, now that you are here, you know, how, how do you feel about it? Like, is what does it feel to make your life dream come true? Yeah, it's a funny thing, Peter, because I know as a, as a young kid, like I think many kids, I thought being an astronaut would be just the coolest job, the coolest thing. I also really had no idea how to achieve that goal. And it also just seemed like far too improbable of a goal to ever set my heart on. And so the one thing that I could do was just kind of pursue things that I found interesting and challenging and pursue passions uh, that I felt in the moment. And so you enabled one of those, as you know, as I was pursuing my PhD in your lab, I was doing a lot of rock climbing. I was getting really interested in search and rescue. And I told you, hey, I, I want to spend some summers uh, working rescue in Yosemite. And I, you know, to this day, I can't thank you enough for your open mindedness in uh, allowing me to go do that, um, to take some summers away from the lab. And I did a lot of great research on my laptop from the star cache while I was out there, um, studied a lot of math that ultimately kind of became my PhD thesis. But yeah, things like that. Um, I'm grateful for uh, people like you that allowed me to really pursue my passions in every moment along the way. And uh, I feel really lucky. Uh, I know there was still a bit of luck involved in getting here. And I'm just so uh, lucky and blessed to uh, have this opportunity. Well, Woody, knowing you the way I know you, and we've known each other both professionally, but also in our personal lives. I mean, I, I could not be more proud to have you up there. And I could not imagine a, a better representative of humanity to be up at the ISS and maybe beyond in, in the future. Woody, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, I can't believe this actually happened. Um, so impressed and proud of you. Um, thanks for making the time. Peter, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, you're making me miss whiteboard sessions, just talking about math in your office. Um, great times. I always tell people that you are the hardest working human I've ever met, and that remains true to this day. Um, I love everything you're doing, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to come on the podcast, Peter. Thank you, Woody. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants from the Robot Brains podcast station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.